very welcome to What Matters program with John Prendergast here with Learmedia.tv. And I'm joined uh, by Dr. Tig Maloney. Uh, Dr. Tig, of course, has been well renowned and known uh, nationally for his research and work into the history of the First World War and many, many Limerick family connections. Tig, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, John, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that I'm uh, renowned. Oh, uh, you are. <laughs> uh, no, you're underestimating now your reputation. You are renowned. And you're one of the good people that actually can speak on history with authority and truthfulness. So well done to you, unlike many others. Um, now, let's go back and turn back the clock. What is it about the First World War that has, more than the Second World War, more than maybe the Napoleonic Wars. What is it that has captivated so many people's attention on the First World War? Internationally? Or yes, internationally and locally. Well, you, well, of course, you see, you had, um, you had this, a lot of countries involved, just as much as you would have had during the Second World War. Yes. But the uh, First World mm. War was, the, was what you might call a major industrial war. Right, okay. Now, you had an industrial war in the American Civil War, where the North was the industrialized side and the, the South was the, the rural side. But in the First World War, it was the first major, so to speak, industrial war, even though quite a lot of horses were still in use. They hadn't, the transport and all that, generally speaking, hadn't yes. become mechanized. I see. To the same right. extent that it was later on. Right. And the horses were, the actual uh, British Army went around Limerick. <clears throat> uh, looking for horses, right? Because they needed horses to 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 pull the artillery as well as anything else. Yes. So they went. There was a there was a place in um, Cecil Street. The signage is still up. It's called Hartigan's Repository. That, I, yes, actually, I've seen it. There used to be. Mm. That used to be. They used to sell horses and all that in there. I see. They also took the horses off. The, we'd say the corporation and, mm -hmm. and other. Uh, Ferrums that chose horses as well. Right, I see. Mm. So there was a huge demand in Ireland oh, for yeah, horses. There was, and there was a huge demand for foodstuffs as well. Yes. Because the Irish, uh, the, the food that was grown here was used with, say, meat and all that. You had the bacon factories. Yes. That meat would be sent out to the front. The front I see. To, to feed yes. the soldiers. Yes. And uh, needless to say, these fellows were delighted at the business they were getting because of the course. profits still all. Yes. Mm -hmm. And isn't the very same today? Warfare means for certain industries billions and billions of yeah, profit. Well, it does insofar as the people now who manufacture yes. the weapons yes. would accrue uh, major profits on right. Certainly would. You know? mm -hmm. Now, can mm -hmm. I just go back and just ask you, how did the First World War start? Well, it was seeding for the period of time because uh well you see britain yes britannia rolled the wheels and the germans oh, wanted something wanted to be up in that league mm. as well so they were vying for a position and it was uh diplomacy was on the verge of failing but what really sparked it was the assassination of the archduke ferdinand in sarajevo yes the first attempt at <clears throat> him in the same place uh, failed there was a grenade thrown at the car with a bounce off it. And he continued on his journey and uh, went down a side street. And there was a fellow by the name of Gavrilo Princip with a revolver. Uh, had his opportunity. And he took it. And he took it. And he shot the, he shot the Duke, the Archduke, and his wife, Sophie. Right. Hmm. And so then you had, um, he was the heir apparent of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you see. So now you had um, you had Austria-Hungary yes. calling upon Serbia to meet certain demands that they, they brought in, that they, they wanted them to meet. Now the uh, the Serbians, it was, it was determined apparently that the Serbians had been responsible for 
the assassinate the group that uh, performed the yes, assassination. The assassination. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they made demands in Serbia. Now, Serbia met with quite a number of the demands, but they couldn't meet with them all. So, Austro-Hungary mm -hmm. were going to declare war in Serbia. Now, if they were going to declare war in Serbia, Serbia would rely on support from Russia. Oh, right, were, yeah. the major the powers. Same, they yes. were of the same, um, yes. what you call it, uh, mentality nearly. Race. Race, yes. And the Austro Hungarians, then you see, relied on the support of Germany. Oh, right. So that's where you had the combinations coming in. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> France was also a part of this Triple Entente. And France would have been on the side of. Um, you said Serbia and the likes of Yes. Germany decided they would like they would knock out France to get it out of the way before they'd attack Russia. Because Russia, France yes. were the uh, the two main protagonists against the mm -hmm. Austro Hungary mm -hmm. and Germany. But uh, the Russians started to mobilize. And the Germans looked at the Russians mobilizing. They didn't want them to mobilize too quickly because they had a massive army, even though they weren't up to the yes. with their weapons. Mm -hmm. But um, they wanted to knock out France before, before they could uh, do anything with Russia. Yes. So what they actually did was, to, in order to attack France, yes. they had to go through Belgium. Right. Now Belgium wouldn't give them permission right. to go through. So the Germans mm -hmm. just decided they Go through Belgium. Take it as their own, nearly. Yeah. Well, in order to get to France. But they, they took over a lot of Belgium. Mm -hmm. And um, Britain issued them an ultimatum, basically, to withdraw from Belgium by a certain time in a, uh, mid, midnight around August the 4th, thereabouts, uh, to withdraw from Belgium. If they didn't withdraw by the time, stipulated Britain would declare war on Germany and that's what happened. Right. So that's how the first world war actually that was started. The, uh, it was basically a European war initially. Okay. It became a world war because a lot of other countries became involved, became as, involved well. as well. Yes. Italy were on the side initially of um Germany and that, but they actually switched. <laughs> they went in on the Allied side then. Right, yeah. And there were two particular individuals in the First World War who became infamous in the Second World War. Right. Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. Oh, of course. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So okay. they were actually part of the of the First World War. Yeah, they're, they were fighting in the First World War. Yes. Mm. What I wanted to ask you was, um, we know about the trade and the, the, the you know, and in, in many ways, even in the 20th, 20th 21st century, you still have those superpowers like France and oh, yeah, well, you, see, you know is, the, North the, Africa. Then you the have Russia. Of these wars, this yeah. war, it still continues. Yeah, you know, right. It still continues to yeah. this day. It might be, it might be warfare, but it's trade. Well, it is trade, and a lot of wars are fought over. And they, trade. yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, in relation to the First World War, we know in this country so many young men left this country to fight on the front line. Oh yeah, well you see we were part of the British mm. Empire at the time. Yes. So. And the army of the day was the British Army. Yes. So men actually This was nineteen seventeen. No no nineteen fourteen. Oh 1914, pardon me. Right, okay. The Americans came into the war in nineteen seventeen. In nineteen seventeen. But um quite a lot of Irishmen had been in the British Army prior to the outbreak of the First World War and they were on the reserve. Right. Okay. That in the event of an outbreak of war that they would be called upon to rejoin because they were on the reserve. Yes. So you had me they go to the they go and get the train to their depot or go over to Britain. Yes. To their depot where they were their headquarters was. And in in uh, Ireland in relation to Limerick now in the Royal Monster Fusiliers, the depot was in Tralee. For Monster. Valley Mullen Barracks. Right. Mm. 
Stein Barracks in Limerick was on the Royal Monster Fusil Air Depot as well. So you had the two <clears> in <throat> Munster? Well, you had Caroline, you had um, Collins Barracks in Cork, it was the Victoria Barracks at yeah. that time. That was another depot of the British Army as well, because there was barracks all over the place, right? And many of these barracks came into existence as a result of the, the 1798 rebellion. Oh, I see, yes. Okay. And I had that. another one up in Bord. Uh, outside border to place called Crinkham, and it was the depot headquarters of the Leinster Regiment, for example. But how many is it estimated young men perished abroad? You mean international uh, mm. Irish men? Irish men. Well, it, there's no exact figure, it's estimated right. around 50,000. 50,000. Mm. That was an incredible amount. But many more than that had actually been in, uh, had joined up. You yes. had the men. You had men who were in the prior to the outbreak, and then you had those who joined up. Fo followed in. Mm. Yes. Many of them did it for different reasons. I know some. Maybe economics. Maybe the economics, a chance to get away. You also had them um, <clears throat> because their family was in there. They joined also. Others did it for adventure. Yes. And you had peer pressure as well. You had various reasons. The bulk of them, it's estimated, would have joined. Uh, for economic reasons. Yeah, of then there was the promise of home rule as yeah. well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when the war concluded... 1918. Well, the Treaty of Versailles wasn't signed until 1919. It was an armistice in 1918. Yes. Mm -hmm. But did home rule, did the British government at that time fulfil its promise of home rule? No. Ah, yes. It did not. Right. <clears throat> it did not. In actual fact, believe it or not, the people who were against home rule, yes. in many respects for the unionists, but they were the first to get home rule, the Stalin parliament. Right. Mm. And we were sitting on the, on, on, on the fence, as it were, left there. Yeah, well, you see, you had, you had others who were impatient, you could say. Yes. And decided they would take matters into their own hands. Which was the start of another. Which was the start of another warfare, conflict. Another conflict. Mm. Now, uh, during your um, very, very uh, specialised research, you came across a number of Limerick families oh, yeah. that were involved. You had, well, you had a family, well, you had a man killed in Gallipoli, for example, David Danner. Yes. He came from Pennywell and he was in the Royal Monster Fusiliers, the 1st Battalion. Yes. They landed on the 25th of April 1915. They came back from Bournemouth because they were stationed there. He was killed on the 25th during the landings. His son went down to become the mayor of Limerick, believe it or not. All oh, right. Mm. Then uh, he was a school teacher in Section Street CPS. Yes, right. He was known as Mousy. Have you seen it? Yeah. Mousy. Mousy then. Uh, <coughs> Moustache? No, something else. Oh, that's <laughs> right, right. Something now, some else. other f uh, familiar names as well from Limerick that you came across. Yeah, well, of course, you see, some <coughs> families were wiped out as a result of yes. them being having gone off the fight. Yes. And you had all of the, they upped and left the city then as well, but looking through some of the names now. Yes. And it's this is actually your book as well, The Impact of World, World War, War I on, on, on Limerick. Yeah. Well worth a read, let me tell you. Uh, let me see now. Again. But in, in, in relation to the First World War, what, what, am I correct in saying it was said it was the war to stop all wars? Well, that's what the expression was used. But yeah. of course, that, needless to say, that didn't transpire. <laughs> that didn't Far from it. All. Yes. Yeah. And the, the horses, do you remember a film actually that yeah. was made about war the horse? horse. Of war, war horse. War horse. The fellow took the horse to the war with him. Yes. Mm. So that was a, a sort of... Uh, a, a, a real life story based on, on true story. Yeah, certainly. Now, when you say that uh, some of the uh, families that were wiped out, they just upped and left. Was it when their heirs or when their successors were or kin were actually killed abroad? You could have said that. In many respects, you had men who went out to fight as well, and, and even though they survived, they, they didn't come back here. Yes. Because the political climate, in many respects, was changing. Yes. So they, they, they decided to stay in Britain, in England. Here's a guy now who was killed in uh, Gallipoli. For example, Private James Lane, 7th Battalion, Royal Monster, she was the now there. 
7th Battalion was a battalion like the 6th, uh, the 7th, 8th and 9th yes. that were fallen at the outbreak of the First World War. They were known as service battalions. They were formed because of the influx of men right. lining up at the time. But this guy was killed in action on the 16th of August, 1915, and he's the age of 19. Oh, dear God. He was the son of Metro and Mary Lane of Belliagna, Arda County Limerick. Arda, West Limerick, know it well. He's commemorated on the Hellas Memorial in Gallipoli. In Gallipoli. Yes. Mm. You have a guy from Limerick City, Private Augustine Neelan, 6th Battalion, Royal Monster Fusiliers, killed in action the 15th of August, 1915. 6th Battalion, Royal Monster Fusiliers. He was born. Uh, and St. Michael's Parish, and his residence, his place of residence was Prospect Hill in Limerick. Yes. And he was an outstanding rugby player for both Young Monsters and Lansdowne Rugby Football Club. Right. Mm. All very young. All very young. 19 years, age, yeah. 18, 20. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was said, very, very sad. It was said in, uh, with regard to the Vietnam War and all that one back, if you remember that. Yes. The average age of a man, of a soldier, Fighting in the Vietnam War was 19. They had a record about it. Yes. Mm. Yeah. No changes. Nothing. There's a guy now, Christopher Flynn. He was an author as well as a playwright. He wrote a book called Lingach Chocolates, Poems and Translations. He had an uncle, Private Thomas Flynn. Yes. Who um, was in the 2nd Battalion, now most of you are there. He was killed in action on the 10th of November 1917. He was 20 years of age. 20, my God. Son of Richard and Bridget Flynn, 16 West Watergate. Down where the Watergate flats have to be. Oh, yes, yes, area. I know them, yeah. And he doesn't have a grave because his body was never found. And he's commemorated on the Tynecott Memorial in Belgium. His family, they became tell his brothers in that now became in fairness and they tried to persuade him not to go but yes. he went <laughs> he joined up and went and Ty is there any in um, any uh, facts or records when people young men joined up like that were they paid oh yeah oh they were paid right and if, if they were married not only if they were married but if their mothers now we said they were living with their mothers <clears throat> their mothers depended yes on the monies that they would have got from work they got what was known as a separation allowance. I see. Right. The mother, some people then, as a result of that, were far better off financially than they had been here before. Of course, see, just to say, it was abused in many respects because some of the women having money that they never had before, they used to go and get drunk and neglect the children. Yes. <laughs> so there was a, a sort of, uh, yeah. Mm. There's an awful similarity or parallel to today's society. You know, too much money. Well, goes to their head. I wouldn't know other people today have too much money because of the way this thing is. People well, are all work uh, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, there was here's another interesting person. Let me see now. Um, he... But you know what, though, when do you think that is there evidence there that uh, Mussolini and Adolf Hitler formed their respective? Political views well, the from there well, the into the next World War. Hitler, Hitler blamed, blamed those who signed the Treaty of Versailles <laughs> and called the armistice of the backstabbers, and he blamed the politicians for that. In actual fact, it was it was the army generals that had to call it, uh, to call the right. laws in the matter because yes. the German army were more or less defeated, but the, when they went back into Germany after the cessation of hostilities. They went back as if they were a triumphant army because the occupied or the Allies hadn't gone into uh, the occupied Germany or anything. They, right. leave them, they left them go back. So they went back marching and they're like, as an undefeated army. Well, but you know, a time as well, when you consider the Second World War, I mean, it took all of Europe and America to beat the Germans, to defeat mm -hmm. them. Well, you see, the Germans had their own like Austro, Austria, Hungary. Yes. Now oh, here's another interesting character. Larry Roach really came from a place called Ballina Mother House, Drummond County, Limerick. East Limerick. 
from an attacker. Attacker, that's mm. right, yes. He was employed as a rent collector by the mm. Limerick Corporation, the well, Limerick City or County, County Council. Yes. Uh, and he played a prominent part in the administrative affairs of the GAA. Right. And he was president of the Kilmallock GAA in, in uh, 1895, uh, vice president of the Central Council for a period, and chairman of the Limerick County Board of the GAA. What age was he? Well, he, he only died in 1940, later on. He survived the war. He survived it, mm. yes. He organised the Drummond Corps of Volunteers and was instrumental for this corps taking the Redmond outside. Yes. During the volunteer split. And, uh, and from, from, you know, the period of 1914 and the, the First World War up to 19... 17 well that was a year after mm -hmm. the 1916 rising yes. um is it complicated or is it just me how irish political parties formed Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Sinn Féin, Labour like did it come from all of that influence of 1916 before it and after it well 1916 <clears throat> It's maintained by those, it's uh, the True Blues. Yes. As the uh, instigator of the, what we're supposed to have today as the Republic. Yes. But the two main parties, well, I won't say there's the two main parties anymore because you have a third party you now that's fairly main in many respects, yes. and that's Sinn Féin. Yes. Even though Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael came out of Sinn Féin. Right, they, they emerged from Sinn Féin. They did. Yes. And they're two civil war parties. Right. Basically. And there's no difference between them and the only well, the uh, father civil war. That's, 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 there's no difference in policies in any way, shape, or form. And they use their own media goons to try and persuade mm. us that See, they're Force so different. He was a secondary school teacher. Yes. And he was future commanding officer of the Limerick Corps of Volunteers. And he was commissioned into 10th Battalion of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. Yes. And um, he was killed in action. Believe it or not, he lived in uh, 36 Clare Street, Limerick. So it and had. He had, a, he had his. Uh, he was the principal of Close, Close Academy and Education Academy in Rutland Street. And uh, he was one. Of, he was an honorary secretary of the Limerick Industrial Association. And he was the last of four brothers to enlist. He had a brother who was a chaplain with the Australian Forces, another brother who was a lieutenant in the Royal Monster Fusiliers. Uh, so he got uh, close, got a temporary commission in the 10th Battalion, yeah. by Dublin Fusiliers. Um, and this was established to cater for the commercial class. Okay. And sons of farmers. Uh, he Can got, I just he got killed in action. Now, the, the food that was produced in this country at that time, right, or at the beginning of the, the hostilities of World mm -hmm. War I, um, they were exported, were they? A lot, a lot of it, a lot yeah. of it was. Yeah, oh yeah. So was, flour, yeah. meal, oh, uh, yeah. meats, mm -hmm. all of that would yeah. have been exported. Wheat, all that stuff, yeah. Wheat, mm. right. Yep. Yeah. So we were just after, maybe if out of the famine in 1840. Yeah. yeah. You know, 1847. And in the famine, the history archives show factually that there was loads of food in this country was still exported out. That's right. And then? There's even a story. Yes. An actual fact that a sheep, a shipload of food was coming from Spain. Why? Right. I think it was Spain. <clears throat> and it met a ship going in the opposite direction from Ireland, but loading down with food. The Spanish ship turned around and said, they have so much food and they're not prepared to use it for themselves. Why should we? Yes. It lacked leadership. They lacked leadership at the time. Well, I don't know what the leadership, but it was an absolute cruel oh, yeah. time. Mm. I mean, men, women and children evicted from their huts or whatever you wanted to call them. They weren't homes. Oh, no. And left on the, on the I'm reading um, uh, a famine diary, and I can tell you, and it's factual, by local uh, Protestant and Roman Catholic parish priests, <clears throat> and what they had to actually witness, and what people, men, eating grass and weeds i mean it's 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 almost 
immorally, it is immorally disgusting. And yet, a, you know, decades on, a group of our Irish men go and fight for the crown. Yeah, well, of course, you see, that was, that was a thing that was done for years and years, even prior to the outbreak of the First World War. Yes. They had joined up, because as I say, it was the army of the country at the time, and a lot of men joined it for, for economic reasons. Uh, of course, yeah, money, if they had to, mm. you know. Here's an interesting guy now, Private George Gardner, and he was still on the 28th of April, 1916, <clears throat> and whose age was reported to have been that of 59 years. Right, 59. And he got killed in action. Yeah. And of course, you know, when, when we look at um, uh, stories like that, or, or hear the facts, you know, a 19-year-old young man going out, or a 20, or an 18, mm -hmm. or a 59, you know, we just say, kill the action, kill the action. But it could have been an awful death. These are the last, these men, you see, they were after, some of them were actually married, but you had quite a number of them who weren't married. Yes. So they were a last generation, Yes. in many respects, that, uh, that didn't live long enough to be able to fulfill whatever yeah. part of life to have gone through. Correct. Were gone. They were gone. They were gone. Just snapped. Mm. Did a lot of them um, go into the First World War, Irishmen and others as well, uh, not realizing the horror that was awaiting yeah, well, them? Of course, nobody knew the horrors that they were going to. On the front line, the trenches. No, they didn't know. They wouldn't have known. No. No experience of warfare in any way, shape. Some of them now would have had experience of the Boer War, 1899 to 1902. Yes. And they would have, some of them would have been on the reserve and recalled and would have gone back to fight the First World War. Mm. But it wasn't the same. Yeah. The Boer War wasn't the same as the, uh, the First World War at all. Do you think, Ty, um, and you have researched this now, and you're, you're, you know the facts as well, is that... I know people in this country hate Churchill. I well, know that. Not everybody does, but... But, you know, he well, wouldn't he be... Was my, yeah. He was responsible for the car, the Jacqueline. Yes. It was his idea. His idea, but exactly. But having said that then, he was the right Prime Minister that Britain had for the Second World War. Yes. Because he didn't believe in appeasing Germany at all, like Chamberlain. Yeah. You come back with this document, uh, peace in our time. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't bending over backwards to... Uh, Facilitate Hitler at all. Yes. Mm. But Hitler actually outmaneuvered many of these politicians. Oh, he did. He did. They were, you see, they were naive enough to believe naive that enough, yeah. Hitler would be true to his word and that. If the Second World War had gone a different way and England had been shoved aside, would they have taken over um, Ireland, Germany? In the Second World War? Yes. Well, there were supposed to have been plans there for that purpose, actually. Yes. Mm. I don't know whether it was called Operation Emerald or Operation Shamrock. I'm not quite sure. Right, but there were plans probably drawn you up. You see, and one of the reasons why the, the Germans would invade Ireland is to use it as a backdoor to Britain. Oh, yes, definitely. Yes. yes. So only for America coming in on the war, the Second World War, there are many people who believe America came into the First World War as a result of the sinking of the Lusitania. Lusitania. Well, actually, the Lusitania was sunk in 1915. Yes. America did not join into the war until 1917. Mm. So there may be an aspect of some, some thing with regard to the Lusitania. But the thing that really, that really pushed America into it was a thing called the Zimmerman Telegram. Okay. Zimmerman was uh, mm. in the Foreign Office in Germany. The foreign secretary of that, I think. Yes. And he telegrammed Mexico to try and get Mexico to come in on the side of Germany because they were next door to America. Yes. They promised Mexico they would give back the likes of New Mexico and Arizona, those places, yes. states that America had taken. Right. Come back if they would come in with the Germans. The telegram was intercepted by British intelligence. <laughs> Yeah, right. And it was produced to the Americans. Right. And that's what and that's mm. But is there mm -hmm. some story, I, I can't remember where I read it a number of years ago. Was there a suspicion that the Lusitania 
was carrying dynamite or arms or don't lose that, don't lose that. And that's another really right reason down. why it was torpedoed. Well, don't lose that actual don't lose that uh, perception of that. Yes. I'm not sure whether it has been fully proven. No, that. I don't think so. No. It's just that uh, whatever eyewitness accounts but the, said it was uh, a but massive Britain, explosion. Britain made good use of it for, uh, for recruiting purposes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that was sunk off the old head of Kinsale. Yes. County Cork, 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 Dominic Cork. Now, tell me, uh, is the wreck of that still there? It is. It is still there. Oh, right. well, of course, that's deemed now a, it's a seaworthy graveyard. Uh, well, you see, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the graveyard of the men who of those who went down the brought men and women. Men and women, mm. yes. How many died in the Canary Well, I people? couldn't give you the Well, over a thousand mm. uh, people anyway, you know, it was a, a, a dreadful, a dreadful it tragedy. It was torpedoed. A torpedo, yes. Torpedoed by a German U boat. Mm. It's just so when you look at the the actual yeah. the actual Germany actually struck a medal to commemorate its sinking. Yeah, without any remorse for innocent lives, yeah. you see, but sure. They say, uh, it's, in for, it's reported in actual fact, historically speaking, <coughs> yeah. that they put a notification in the New York Times of that stating, yes. advising people not to travel on the Lusitania. All right. what might happen. Mm. And by God, it did. Mm. An awful, awful tragedy. Well, we're going to leave it there for part one. Uh, there's so much to, to cover. This is a part of a, a series with uh, Dr. Tyg Maloney. And we thank you as well. And I think it's very, very good to have all points of view on what happened actually during the famine that led into the First World War, mm. that led into the Second World War, and all that happened in between. Because I think they're all connected. Oh, and they're all interconnected in some way. In Definitely, some way. yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. We leave it there, and that's it from Lear Media TV. What matters program with myself, John Prendergast, and the company here, Dr. Tyke Maloney. We will be back with you shortly again with part two. Now, also, just to let you know that we have a number of uh, serious issue programs uh, coming up to do with um, self harm and uh, pollution. And all of that will be done courtesy of LearMedia.tv and myself. So thanks to Mary Hone and Pat Barry, Dr. Ty, from all of us here, go to Meadow Market, August Sloan. No.